Praise the Lord. Well, it sure is good to be with you here tonight. Appreciate you being here. Are you ready for the Word of God? Yeah, well, you see, I don't have any notes here tonight. These are just some things uh, that I've been meditating on and feel very led uh, to speak about. Praise God. Well, you're all back. You know, we, of course, had a fun service on Sunday morning. We talked about some things that we, we didn't really plan on talking about. Oh, boy, I've gotten a, a lot of response to that message in both ways. <laughs> oh, glory to God. Boy, it is amazing to me how every time, you know, even in this case, the Holy Ghost would prompt us to talk about putting down drinking, how it just, it stirs people up. Oh boy, what does that mean? Christians are trying to look to the Bible to find, you know, permission to drink booze. Folks, you're going to have a hard time with that. Going to have a hard time with it, but it's a Amazing every time several you know folks you know respond or they say something or I, I hear something passed along to me where people get upset with that folks you know uh, uh, we're gonna have to be doers of the word we're gonna have to be doers of the word amen go with me in your Bibles go over to Mark chapter 16 and tonight I'm gonna call this message the war between f spirit and flesh the war between spirit and flesh. Now, this may go in a direction that you would not think with a title like that. Uh, you know, obviously, uh, I'm not going to go into a super deep dive on this topic. We may extend it right into uh, this coming Sunday service. But let's go to Mark chapter 16, and let's go to verse 15. We're going to read the Great Commission. And the reason why I just feel so led to start with this passage of Scripture, because folks, we've got to remember that the gospel that we serve is a supernatural gospel. It is a supernatural gospel. You know, I've been praying about you know, uh, the plan of what we will do in this city to get more souls saved. Folks, you know, uh, whether you believe this or not, I believe many of you do, there's a mandate on this church to do something uh, to make sure that when we stand before Jesus, we will be able to actively say that we did everything we could to give our city and our region an opportunity to know Jesus Christ. And I'm going to tell you what, it's going to look different than we think. And I'll tell you what, the direction that the Lord is going to take us, it may, pe it may cause people to look at us funny. It may cause people to insult us or, you know, uh, you know get all upset, you know, because it's not going to be with the programs of man. It's going to be with the mercy and the power of God. And I just, I just feel so led. Go over here uh, to the, the, the Great Commission. And in this passage, we get... Our answer. We get how God has already chosen, you know, to win communities and to win the world. Jesus speaking, of course, after his resurrection, and Jesus is now alive and, and he has risen again, and he's talking to his disciples, and he said unto them, Go you into all the world and preach or proclaim the gospel to every creature. Amen. Amen. There it is. There's a good start. But how many of you know so many places just stop right there? You know, they stop right there. We'll just, you know, uh, uh, preach the gospel and that's all. But look at verse 16 and we're going to read, you know, down a few verses. Jesus speaking, he says, He that believes and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believes not shall be damned or condemned. And these signs shall follow them that believe. In my name shall they hold committees and programs and have methods and strategies. Oh, wait. And these signs shall follow them that believe in my name shall they what? Cast out devils or demons. They shall speak with new tongues. They shall take up serpents. And if they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. They shall lay hands on the sick and the sick shall recover. Amen. And then we might as well just finish out the chapter. It says, So then after the Lord had spoken unto them, he was received up into heaven and sat on the right hand of God. And they, the disciples, went forth, preached everywhere. They did the first part, right? Amen. They preached the gospel to everybody they could. And it says, the Lord working with them and confirming the word with signs following. And we already know what those signs following were, right? Amen. Folks, I wanted to start here because I, 
uh, I just have it impressed upon me that when we realize, when we, we start thinking about and desiring to see more people saved, to see the gospel move forward, you know, sometimes it's so easy to start trying to, you know, get methods and start putting uh, uh, programs together. But folks, what's going to win the world is the mercy of God, the power of God. Amen. And I'll tell you what, you know what this world needs to see? It needs to see those signs following believers. Yes. It needs to see signs following the believers. Because folks, when you look at the supernatural element of the gospel, I mean, look at Jesus said, he said, when you become a believer, and obviously we seek him, we know him, we know the word, these signs are gonna follow us, right? We're gonna cast out demons or take authority over the enemy. Yeah. Amen. We're gonna speak in new tongues or have a divine connection or communication with heaven, amen, which the Bible goes on to extensively tells us is a connection to God's power. It builds our most holy faith, amen. And then, you know, the, the scripture goes on, you know, to say uh, that these Christians will not be hurt, they will not be harmed. And then it goes on to say that we'll lay hands on the sick and the sick shall recover. Folks, all these things are only possible through a close personal relationship with Jesus. And we see that God has not chosen a gospel that is dependent upon the flesh. There is no arm of the flesh to lean on here. There is no method of man. There is no strategy of man that is going to work. Only these things are going to work. There's no strategy. And believe me, I've been guilty of trying to think up some. You know, if there was some kind of just administrative way that we could go out and win this city, you know, we would. But it's not going to be administrative. It's going to be the power of God. It's going to be the mercy of God. Folks, we're living in the days where the body of Christ is turning to the arm of the flesh to try to fulfill the com Great Commission. Folks, we are seeing it. Many believers, they just stop at verse 15. We'll just proclaim the gospel and there's so many different programs, so many different, you know, churches are relying on, on, on social activities. They're relying upon programs. They're trying to build committees, you know, and all these things that are falling short. They're trying to build sports programs. They're trying to build, you know, uh, gymnasiums. And they're trying to have all this and calling it outreach. I'm here to tell you, those things have great intentions. And there's nothing wrong with Christians getting together and fellowshipping over a game or something like that. But folks, I'm here to tell you that is not the way God has called to win uh, uh, the, the, the world. He is not called, you know, to have social groups and singles groups in churches. He's not called to have, you know, the art class in the church and all this stuff. Folks, we have got, there's a blueprint to getting this city saved. And that blueprint is the signs that follow them that believe. It is the signs. Now, of course, uh, again, we are not putting our focus where we're trying to have an experience with God. But we know this, you are never going to lay hands on the sick and see the sick recover unless you have a personal and powerful relationship with Jesus. You are never going to care enough about the sick without walking close with Jesus Christ. You're never going to care enough to uh, lay hands on somebody and cast a devil out of them or take authority over the devil for them. I'm telling you, we've got to be careful because the body of Christ is turning to the arm of the flesh to try to reach the world, and it is failing. It is failing failing. Folks, we serve a powerful gospel. Amen. It is a gospel that casts out the devil. It is a gospel that speaks in new tongues and communicates with our heavenly father and gets divine revelation and divine plans. Someone that sets themselves aside to get into the presence of God to win those souls around us. There is no committee. There is no program. There is no ball game. There is no social club church that is ever going to get that done. Amen. Folks, and when I say this, I know it seems, you know, uh, uh, like I'm attacking something or somebody. I'm not. But folks, we just using this as an illustration, churches that once had full sanctuaries went and decided to build the gymnasium, and now they have a full gymnasium in an empty sanctuary. It is going on everywhere. It's going on in our community because what is that? It's the arm of the flesh. People's hearts are not going to be reached through committees and programs and all this stuff. They're going to be reached by the power of God. They're going to be reached through believers that have results. 
Folks, I don't know about you. I am so glad I've been taught the full gospel. I am glad to have been taught the full gospel. Folks, yes, there are excesses. There can be excesses in the Pentecostal movement, and I've done everything within my power to always make sure to keep those excesses out. But of course, with the few things that we got to be careful of and, and the things that we've got to guard against, there's a thousand reasons to be so glad that we've been raised up in a full gospel church that will actually not stop at verse 15, but we'll go down there and read the rest of the passage. Amen. Why? Because I'm so glad someone taught me how to take authority over the devil. Folks, stop being like so many Christians today that are growing up in the denominational churches. They don't realize it, and it's not their fault. They just haven't been taught, and this isn't being personal, but they're just open prey. They're open game for the enemy because no one ever taught them the power of the name of Jesus Christ. They never taught them how to tell the enemy to take his hands off their family. Thank God that we were taught how to be baptized in the spirit and how to pray in other tongues. Amen. And make that direct connection to God. Thank God that we were taught how to lay hands on the sick. Thank God that we were taught uh, about the healing power of God. You know, let's never take that for granted. Amen. Thank God that we've been taught how to prosper God's way. God's way. You know, as we were praying there, that scripture just kind of came up in my spirit. You know, over there in Psalm 1-3, it says, He, and of course, is talking about the one that meditates in the word of God day and night shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water who shall bring forth his fruit in his season and his leaf shall not wither and whatsoever he does shall prosper. Thank God. There is a true prosperity, but of course, just like with any doctrine of the Bible, our motives and our intentions are the base of it all. You know, we can't have our motives just to get money. We can't, you know, succumb to those greedy gimmicks, you know, on, on Christian TV. That is, all that stuff is wrong. We've talked about it. We've swept that clean. But don't you sweep the rest of it away either. Amen. Thank God that we have been taught you know, how to uh, do these things. Amen. And now there's a danger because when we start in the spirit, the Bible teaches us that over time there will come a temptation to move spirit-filled believers into the direction of the flesh. And let me show you this. Go to the book of Galatians and let me show you the example of the Galatian churches. Go to Galatians chapter three. Folks, it is going to take spirituality to win this city. Yes. Folks, how many of you remember a minister by the name of Lester Summerall? Yes. Lester Summerall was a mighty man of God. He ministered in, you know, in the 20th century. Uh, you know, he was, as a young man, he was kind of a protege to Smith Wigglesworth. Uh, of course, he ended up being a very powerful uh, traveling man of God and went all over the world. If you have never read the book, Run With a Vision, I'm telling you, you've missed half your life. If you want to sit down and get stirred up to do something for God, I mean, you will read that book and you will feel like you've done nothing for God. Read it. It's in my desk 24-7. It is one of the books that is in my top drawer in my desk at home where, you know, I, I work in my office. It is absolutely just amazing. But if you're aware of his work in Manila, Philippines, uh, I mean, a whole city was, was uh, completely uh, vitalized for the gospel. I mean, just an absolute uh, just breakout for God happened there. How many of you remember that story? What happened? You know, many of you do. Some of you don't. That's OK. Uh, I'll just kind of fill you in. I mean, it was revival. And he was there in Manila, and nothing was really happening much in his ministry. And uh, he was watching TV there uh, one day, and there was this story of this girl who was in a local prison, and she was being tormented. I mean, uh, and it was so supernatural that the TV cameras even caught this stuff and reported on it. Uh, I believe her name was what, Maria Villanueva? 
Um, I believe that was the name of this girl uh, who was just uh, uh, psychotic. She was just tormented. And they would show her in her prison cell, and she kept saying that something was trying to bite her. That, and, and, and they thought she was just, you know, mentally insane. But then out of nowhere, bite marks would start appearing all over her body. And she would sit there and try to, it looked like she was trying to fight something off, but nobody could see what she was trying to fight. Well, as, you know, and they were reporting on this, like, day after day. And he kept just watching the news. And one day, the Spirit of God told him, go down there and cast the devil out of that girl. And he went down there on day one and nothing happened. But long story short, uh, eventually uh, uh, he gained access. They allowed him to, to go in there and he literally cast that devil out of that girl and she got completely set free, completely set free in her mind and her body. And uh, uh, praise God, it caused a revival to break out. And uh, he ended up establishing a church there that won thousands and thousands and thousands of people. A, 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 a revival broke out where uh, ministers came in and they literally were having crowds of hundreds of thousands of people. I remember one story, one well-known minister went and literally laid hands on a hundred thousand people, lined them up two by two as far as the eye could see, and he just walked through the crowd laying hands on them. I mean, just a powerful revival. And it was not the result of a program or a committee or a sports game or something like that. It was the result of the mercy and the power of God. What was it? Those people saw results. They saw the power of God move. And I'm telling you, it is going to be the power of God that is going to set this city free. It is going to be the power of God. But somebody somewhere has got to get hungry for it. Somebody somewhere has got to believe for it. Somebody somewhere has got to pay the price for it. Amen. But if we're not careful, we will start to drift back to the arm of the flesh. And all of a sudden, we'll start coming up with ideas and methods of man and programs. And, and believe me, I've, I've, I've started to even catch my own mind. So like, what do we do, you know, to get more people saved? And yeah, there may be some things at times that, of course, it's never wrong to go and feed the poor. It's never wrong to, you know, preach the gospel, you know, in, in whatever setting. But, you know, it's going to take the power of God to get it done. Amen. Amen. Look at Galatians chapter three. Watch this. You say, well, Pastor, what does this have to do about the war between spirit and flesh? Well, you're going to see here, and, and, and actually what we're going to talk about in our short time here tonight is the first step that is almost always overlooked about dominating the flesh and making sure to protect and guard your spirit. Look at Galatians 3.1. Now remember, Galatians was written to a series of churches in the region of Galatia. And of course, they had in context, you know, the entire uh, epistle to the Galatians written by Paul the Apostle. And they had become Christians, they had accepted Christ. And then somewhere along the line, they started to drift back into Judaism. They started to drift back into believing that circumcision would save them. They started to believe that the Old Testament, you know, uh, uh, rituals and things would save them. And so Paul writes them a very powerful letter by the Holy Spirit, warning them that, listen, you received the grace of God through the, power, through the Spirit, right? It wasn't through the law. And so that's what's going on here in Galatians 3. He says, oh, foolish Galatians. <laughs> See, you thought I said tough stuff. <laughs> oh, foolish Galatians. Who has bewitched you? Which is an interesting statement. Hold on to that one. That you should not obey the truth. Before whose eyes Jesus Christ has been evident, evidently set forth, crucified among you. This only would I learn of you, received you the spirit. He says, I want to know this from you. He's like, tell me, tell me this. Answer me this question. Did you receive the spirit, the Holy Ghost, by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? Let's answer that question. By the hearing of faith. Amen. All right. Meaning Paul is talking about how that the Old Testament law was based on the flesh of man. 
It was not based. God never based it upon the spirit. It was a law to show and to prove how sinful we were. All right. The law never made anybody spiritual. The law redeemed nobody, so to speak. All right. All right. Faith in the coming Messiah was how they were redeemed, just like we are redeemed by faith in Jesus. And now verse three, he says, are you so foolish? Having begun in the spirit, are you now made perfect by the flesh? Have you suffered so many things in vain, if it be yet in vain? He therefore that ministers to you the spirit and works miracles among you, does he do it by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? Let's answer that question. By the hearing of faith. All right. He said, you started off. You started off in the miraculous power of God. You started off in the grace in the Holy Spirit of God. And then you be, he said, you begun in the spirit. And then you started to drift and fall back and lean upon the flesh. Folks, that could be very true even right here at Family Church if we're not careful. We got to make sure to dance with the doctrines that brought us. All right. Where all of a sudden the same thing is happening in our day that churches that were, uh, you know, once, you know, on fire for the spirit of God, once on fire for, you know, the word of God, all of a sudden start drifting back into things that are just the arm of the flesh. They start to drift back and rely on programs. They start to rely on methods of man and committees and all this stuff. Folks, we got to be careful about this. Oh, praise the Lord. But the question is, how did this happen? He said, there were miracles wrought in your midst. Folks, there's been miracles wrought in our midst. Folks, uh, 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 we've seen things that have happened around here throughout the years. Amen. You know, and, uh, and all the glory to God for that. But they started, you know, as this, you know, Holy Spirit filled, you know, uh, redeemed church. And then they started to drift back. You know, they started to just go back to the comfortable ways of the law. The stuff that was just easier to follow the law than it was to get in and actually pursue and seek and, and hear the voice of God. It's so much easier. The law was just plain. Do this. Don't do that. Do this. Don't do that. But now all of a sudden in the New Testament, it's no longer based on law. It's now based on relationship. And God says, if you want to know, you got to start here, but then you got to set yourself aside and come aside and seek me and pray and take time and hear his voice. See, the Galatian church, they were a powerful church. They once were under the grace of God. They were once, you know, seeking him, living a true spiritual life. And then Paul says, you started in the spirit but now you've drifted back to the flesh. How does that happen? This may be one of the most overlooked truths of the whole book of Galatians. Go back up there to verse one. He says, oh foolish Galatians. Look what he says, look at the next phrase. Who has bewitched you? He said, who got around you and changed your mind? Who got you to slow down? Who got you out of prayer? Who got you out of this? Right. See this? Yeah. You say, well, that just seems like a statement that he just kind of threw, you know, out there. No, 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 no. You're going to see later on here, we're going to look uh, uh, in just a moment, uh, later on in the book of Galatians, there was somebody that came amongst them. There was somebody that came amongst them. Go over to chapter five. I'll show you this. Oh, Folks, this is the first Line, and I tell you what, you think I got some people mad on Sunday morning. People will try to misunderstand what I'm going to say here tonight. I will make it as clear as I possibly can. But let's read this passage here. Galatians 5. Now, start in verse 2, just so you see what he's talking about. These Christians thought that they should go back and be circumcised as if they were under the Old Testament law. They thought it was necessary to be saved. And Paul is saying, no, no, no. The law has been fulfilled through Jesus Christ. You don't need to go back and rely on a, 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 a fleshly ritual. In verse 2, he says, Behold, I, Paul, say unto you, 
that if you be circumcised, Christ has profit you nothing. Meaning if you think circumcision is your salvation, then Christ died for nothing. He says, for I testify again to every man that is circumcised that he is a debtor to do the whole law. Meaning if you, you know, pursue that ritual, you're going back you know, to the Old Testament, you're taking a step backwards. Now you say, well, pastor, we're not you know, tempted to go back to the Old Testament law, but it's the same idea of going back and relying upon the flesh. We can make things a law. We can be in church every single service and not be seeking God. We're just living a law. You can be here showing up to your post. Maybe you serve on the worship team, maybe in the nursery, maybe in the sound, maybe in the ushers, maybe in the cleaning crew. You could show up at your post every single time you're here in every single service, which is highly appreciated, all right? But if all of a sudden that's what you're doing and there's no personal relationship, you've turned those things into a law. You're just living a law. You're just living on the, the extension of the flesh. Oh boy, let's keep going here. Verse four, he says, Christ has become of no effect to you. Whosoever of you are justified by the law, you are fallen from grace. Wow, that's interesting. For we through the spirit wait for the hope of righteousness by faith. For in Jesus Christ, neither circumcision avails anything nor uncircumcision avails anything, but faith which worketh by what? Love. love. Now, I've said this before. I'm going to say it again. And it's, it's not wrong, you know, uh, to preach it this way. But a lot of times when we see Galatians 5, 6 being preached, we think that it's talking about your faith will only work when you walk in love towards people, which is not untrue. But that's not the purpose of this verse. All right. This verse where it says circumcision nor uncircumcision avails nothing but faith in the Lord through your personal love and devotion for him. That's good. That's good. It's not about your love for other people. It's about your love for him Amen. and God's love for you. Yep. Meaning you believe how much God loves you. And therefore you act and you live your life from the standpoint of you loving God. Yeah. Faith works when you love him. Yes. And when you love him, you obey him. And when you love him, you seek him. See, this is talking about a relationship with Jesus Christ, loving him, seeking him. Amen. What's going to inspire you to pray? Loving him. What's going to inspire you to truly worship God? You're in love with him. What's going to truly bring you to the point where you have the courage and the boldness to lead somebody to Jesus? Uh, it's loving God. Yes. Loving God's going to move you to be that witness. Amen. Amen. Because without God in your heart, without a, a revelation of his love and care for the lost, you aren't going to be motivated to do so. But we're not done here. Go to verse 7. He says, you did run well. He said, you were running well. You were doing good. But remember, they started in the spirit and they started to drift back into the flesh. Are you getting something out of this? He said, now look at verse seven. Who did hinder you that you should not obey the truth? So there we see this again in, in chapter three. He said, who bewitched you? Right. Now he's saying, who hindered you? Right. Paul's trying to figure this out. He said, you didn't get this from me. You know what I mean? He said, you didn't, you know, somewhere you were running and then all of a sudden there's this change in you. Something came along and changed this up. Verse eight, he says, this persuasion comes not of God that calls you. He said, you've been, you've been pushed back into the flesh. He said, God isn't persuading you to do this. He says, a little leaven leavens the whole lump. He says, I have confidence in you through the Lord that you will be no otherwise minded. But he that troubles you shall bear his judgment whosoever he be. Do you see how Paul, I mean, clearly the spirit of God is telling Paul, someone got in there. Someone got in there. So there was influence somewhere. Oh boy, somebody convinced them. 
Look at verse 12. He said, I would or I would prefer that they were even cut off, which troubled you. Ooh, boy. All right. Folks, why am I talking about this when I titled this message, The War Between Spirit and Flesh? You know, so often when we think of the war between spirit and flesh, you know, we think about the temptations that come against our body. We think about, you know, the, the, the thoughts of our mind and, and all that stuff. And that's true. It's a personal battle. But I believe this is the first and foremost step. If you are going to guard your spiritual life, you are going to have to guard who you fellowship with. Now, what I got to do is I've got to explain this. Folks, please listen to me right now. I am not saying, nor would I ever say, that we should not fellowship with denominational Christians. That is not what I'm saying. Does everyone, everyone looking at me? All right, I did not say that. Praise God for our brothers and sisters in Christ and other churches and, and things. And I know how people will try to twist what I'm about to say. They will try to turn it like, you know, and also I don't want you to carry this too far and think that I'm trying to make this church exclusive or something. I'm just making a practical statement here. All right, folks, thank God. Listen, listen. If you're blood-bought, spirit-filled, if you're walking in that great commission that we talked about in Mark chapter 16, you have the power to bring people up. Yeah. Meaning you've got something, and it doesn't mean that you're an elite, but I'm just making the point that, let's face it, not many churches today are preaching beyond Mark 16, 15. Sure. They don't preach authority over the enemy. Right. They don't preach praying in other tongues. They don't preach a supernatural protection. They don't preach the laying on of hands. They don't preach healing. Right. And folks, here is my concern. And this is what the Spirit of God is saying because this is, you know, what's coming on me today. I purposely did not write notes down. I purposely did not want to, to uh, put notes down. I, I knew where we were going and so I just want to get into the Word. But this is the point. Folks, we've got to be careful all right, not to, how can I word this? But if you're putting your closest confidence with people and even believers that make fun of you or bring you down for being a tongue-talking, spirit-filled believer, oh, yeah. you better watch out for that. Oh, yeah. You know, if you surround yourself with people that, you know, they, 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 they don't believe in healing, they don't believe in the laying on of hands. Now, again, a lot of times it's just ignorance. They haven't been taught. But I'm saying it's one thing to go and, and to be a blessing and to teach and to help bring somebody up. You know what I mean? But I'm talking about putting your confidence, you know, investing your friendships all in that direction. Are you making sense? Am I making sense to you? Because you can start in the spirit and somebody can get around you and, and all of a sudden you can start to feel ashamed of being a tongue talker. All of a sudden, you start to be ashamed of being someone that believes in healing. You know, and all of a sudden, you're surrounded, and you better be careful that you're not outnumbered by that kind of thing. And when I say that, people will try to say, oh, he's trying to tell us we shouldn't be friends with Christians from other churches. That is the last thing in the world I'm trying to say. But I am trying to make the point that it, why is it always easier for someone to bring us down than it is for us to bring them up? Folks, do not be ashamed of being a spirit-filled believer. These signs shall follow them that believe. If they see you laying hands on somebody, they think it's weird, let them think it. Folks, if, if they hear, you know, you know, if you hide the fact that you're spirit-filled, then you're ashamed of the fact that you're spirit-filled. And the power of God does not go in the direction of those that are ashamed of these things. Because the gospel is not a set of programs and committees and just little projects and you know all these things. The gospel is a gospel of believing, 
It is a gospel of preaching the gospel with the power of God. It is a gospel of being filled with the Spirit, casting out demons, taking authority over the enemy. Amen. Laying hands on the sick and the sick shall recover. But yet, it's so easy because it, listen, you know how many times this church has been called a cult? <laughs> They're a cult. You know, they lift their hands and they praise God. And I heard they even speak in tongues over there. <laughs> these signs shall follow them that believe. You know, these signs shall follow. And folks, it's very interesting. You know what is actually going to turn the world to Christ? Power and results. Power and results. Programs, committees, and, and, and all that stuff. It's not going to work. It's not working. It's not. It's not at all. And, you know, sometimes I get asked all the time, how come the church doesn't do this? How come we don't do that? Because we don't invest in programs because it's, they'll become a law. Yeah. It's so easy. All of a sudden, it just becomes like a law. You're just setting up new things to do, new, new rules to have. Folks, the gospel, it, we can't be ashamed of all that it is, right? You know, we know what Romans says, you know, over there in chapter one, verse, what is that, 16 or 17 down there? He's, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation, you know? And so the point I'm making is when you start to put people, it's one thing to put somebody around you because you're, you're trying to mentor them. You're trying to bring them up. You're trying to witness to them. You're trying to, uh, 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 you know, grow their spiritual life. But if you're putting yourself around a situation where nobody believes like you, you I'll tell you what, you're not going to bring all them up. They're going to bring you down. And next thing you know, you're going to start saying, you know what? I don't believe in healing anymore. You know what? I don't know if I believe in uh, praying in tongues anymore. You know, I don't know if I believe in healing. I don't know if I believe, you know, that God prospers us. Well, there's a lot of abuses in prosperity, but none of us would be anywhere where we're at without it. So you have no idea. You've been, listen, the fact that you're here tonight, you've been prospered somewhere. Thank God, because you've been faithful and, and God's faithful. Amen. I mean, I mean, we tithe, we put God first, we seek him first and his righteousness and these things are added to us. You know, we don't, I don't live, I love what Reverend Greer said when he was here. He said, I'm not living for fame. I'm not trying to get fortune. He said, I'm not even trying to have a worldwide ministry. He said, I'm just trying to know Jesus. See, you know what that is? That's Matthew 6, Seek ye first his kingdom and his righteousness, amen? And these things will be added to you. You know, uh, I love it when people have that revelation. In the same way, I'm not seeking the miracles. I'm not seeking signs. But when we're in love with him and we follow him and we fellowship with him, those signs are going to follow. And so, folks, I just wanted to start with this first step. Uh, many times the battle with the spirit and the flesh, it begins with our associations in this life. You know, it won't be long you know, uh, and, and to be honest, when I say this, I almost cringe to hear myself say it because it could be so easily mistaken as me saying that this church is, you know, uh, exclusive or above something. I'm just saying it's actually getting more and more rare what our church believes. All right. It's getting more and more rare. And a lot of people are, 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 you know, a lot of believers. They don't want to look at it. They don't want to consider it. They would rather criticize it. I mean, how many times uh, have, has this church been called that church? It's a cult. It's all that. You better be careful. I'll tell you what. If somebody, you know, uh, calls my church a cult, I tell them, no, it's not. No, it's not. You know, I love when, when, when someone says, well, you know, the people in our church just seem a little different from some others. Darn right they're different. You better believe it. You don't say, well, I don't know. They might be a little weird or a little different or, or something like that. Why? You know, because they, 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 they pray in the spirit. Why? Because they, they, they praise and they worship. The Bible says we're called the peculiar people. <laughs> I know it sounds like I'm making a joke there, but that's absolutely true. Yeah, I'm like, well, you know, and when people say, well, I don't know, people think the people from our church are a little different, and believe me, it can happen. 
where, where people, you know, try to carry themselves. Please don't ever carry yourself like you are some kind of a, an elitist. That is not the purpose. But I'm saying if you, you know, if someone says you're different or strange because, you know, you're walking in love, because you believe in the power of God, because you believe in healing, because you believe in the laying on of hands, you believe in casting out demons. If they think you're a little different for all that, so be it. So be it. That's a badge of honor. Amen. And I'm telling you, folks, I, I sit in this city, I mean, all the time. You know, when I say this, I, I, I love this town I mean, I love it, but this town's got some issues. I mean, my goodness, uh, you can go down and uh, I call it, you know, dinner and a show. You can go down to Brooklyn Square. You can grab yourself a Tim Hortons coffee, sit down there. And I mean, it is wild what comes walking by. And I think to myself, oh my goodness, there is no program you know, uh, when I say this, I know we, we, we laugh about it and things, and I'm not, I'm not trying to be funny, nor am I trying to, you know, blame anybody for getting a chuckle out of it. But, I mean, literally, I say this. I say, my goodness, it's like somebody's out on the Jamestown zombie walk. Yeah. I mean, there's like a Jamestown zombie walk. I, I, I sit downtown, and, and I just watch. I'm like, my goodness. Yeah. There's no program. No. There's no program right. that's going to save these people. No, right. There is none. Right. Folks. The only thing that is going to reach the city in this county and in this area, you know, uh, is going to be the power of God through people who personally know Jesus, who personally know him and say, oh, hey, hey, can I, can I pray with you? You know, uh, and aren't afraid, you know, to, to witness to them and, and, and lay hands on them for healing. And they may need uh, some devils cast out of them. I mean, my goodness, I'll, I'll, you know, sit down there and I'll watch what's going on. And you can see, I mean, people talking into the open air. They're, they've got passengers. This town has been inundated with, you know, uh, fentanyl and, and meth and all this stuff. I'll tell you what, playing nice with the enemy is not going to get anybody anywhere in this city. Somebody is going to have to set themselves aside. They're going to have to get full with God. It does not have to be a church program, but everywhere you go, you know, people that you know in your life, family, co-workers and that, we're going to start have to winning this city one soul at a time. And somewhere, somebody, God's going to have to raise up. And I'm not even saying it's me. All right, I am not saying that. You know, I'm not talking about one individual, but God's going to have to raise up people with the courage and the ability to talk to those folks and get them delivered. Amen. But I'm telling you, it is never going to happen if we just surround ourselves with everybody who is always poo-pooing the power. You know what I mean? Always got an excuse. You know, I mean, uh, always got an excuse why they want to drink a little. Always got an excuse why tongues isn't for today. Always have an excuse why, you know, they've never heard a, a thing about casting out demons in their, in their pulpits. Folks, I'm just making the point that the battle between spirit and flesh, the first step is making sure that somebody is not in your midst hindering you making you feel ashamed and low for being a spirit-filled Christian. No, please do not go to the counter at Wegmans and hop up on there and start speaking in tongues. Please do not go to Walmart. Well, actually, I don't think they'd even notice at Walmart. That'd probably be the most normal thing that happened all day long there. You know? <laughs> You go to the self-checkout area there. I mean, you might as well just start casting out demons there. It's a whole, it's like a corral of devils. <laughs> and I'm saying that kind of tongue in cheek, uh, but please don't go out in public and make a, a, you know, an embarrassment of yourself. But I'm just saying, watch out. If you're always just fellowshipping with people that, you know, they don't believe that, they don't believe in these things, I'm telling you, it's going to bring you down. It's going to bring you down. Paul was like, wait a minute. Wait, what happened to you, Galatians? What happened to you? I mean, all of a sudden in chapter three, and actually you could go to chapters one, two, three, four, and five. I mean, he starts saying, wait, who got around you? Who, who started hindering you? Who bewitched you? Where, did you? where did you start getting? Someone moved in. 
you know, all of a sudden you were on fire for God and then someone started cooling you off. I'm telling you, you hang out with people that are cooling off. You know, they're going to cool you down as well. Folks, you get something out of this here tonight? And I know, I know we didn't talk about, you know, personal uh, temptations upon our flesh. But folks, I, I truly believe, you know, I, I've never really considered that before. I just was led, you know, to Galatians. I started saying, my goodness, over and over, Paul's saying, who hindered you? Who got to you? Who troubled you? Who is he? Yeah. Ask yourself that question. Yeah. Now, please, because as a pastor, <laughs> people, there's some of you that are already sympathizing with me. When I teach something, people have a way of overcorrecting. And so people, what they do is they hear a message like this and they, they take up a scorched earth policy. <laughs> you know what I mean? They just say, go and burn everything down. Is that what I'm saying? I'm talking about your closest personal confidences. People that you surround yourself with. Unless you are there, you know, one-on-one -on -one bringing them up. But if you're surrounding yourself with people, that's why the Bible calls it like precious faith. You know, we need to understand, don't let somebody convince you out of what it's like to be spirit-filled. Don't get convinced away from believing in healing. Folks, this is happening, just so you know. This is happening all over the place. You'd be shocked to hear you know, ministers all of a sudden, you know, I, you know they, they had an experience, someone they knew or they loved got sick, and all of a sudden they just, they don't believe in healing anymore. Or all of a sudden, you know, they got around you know, folks that don't believe in praying in tongues, all of a sudden you start noticing they don't believe in it anymore. And all of a sudden, you know, they don't believe in laying on a hand. See, one by one, the devil's going to take away the very foundation upon which you're brought on. Listen, you know, dance with the do doctrines that brought you, yeah. folks. Nothing wrong with making sure that we're balanced and rightfully divided. But, you know, be careful about, you know, uh, uh, learning these things and to step away. We know what the scripture says about that. It'd be better not to know the truth than to know it and to fall back from it. That's right. And it all begins with what? Our associations. Our associations. Who sharpens you? Yeah. Who sharpens you? Who challenges you? Yeah, Being around them just, you know, makes you want to do better. You know, praise the Lord. Find that person. Find those people. You know, amen. And let's be spirit-filled believers. I truly believe there's got to be something you know, in Christianity, that's not this legalistic, dried up, no power, everything is ceased kind of Christianity. And it seems like our only other choice, if we're going to be full gospel people, it's almost like you got to be weird, kooky, and crazy. There's got to be the power and the grace of God with maturity. There's got to be. I believe it. I truly believe it. That's why I brought Reverend Greer in, because he exemplifies that. He, example, he is a great example of that. I mean, especially, I wish I could have brought you all to lunch. I should have just secretly recorded them and we just put it up on the screen and, and listened to just how balanced and sensible and, of course, biblical. And uh, it just it helped me. But just make sure. Make sure you're not surrounding yourself or, you know, with people who are talking you out of the power of God. Amen. Let's pray. Father God, we just love you and praise you. Father, you are so good.